What we're going to make today is a button like this. So this is the ones that I did already. Um, we're going to focus on this top one, the upgrade button. And my thoughts around this is maybe it's part of a sci-fi game. Um, so we want it to look quite high tech. Um, and it's quite an important button. So we want it to look quite shiny and interesting. We want people to press it. Um, and I'm going to show you how to make this starting out in Adobe Illustrator. You could use a different vector program if you want to. Uh, Illustrator is what we use in the industry. Um, and typically, I make my starting shapes in Illustrator. And then I copy them over into Photoshop, which is what we're going to do. And that's where we add all the styles, like colors and gradients and glows and add the text on top and, and things like that. So this just gives you a little idea of what this process is going to look like and how you can go from something very simple, like a flat shape, and just gradually build up these effects step by step until you have something that feels very finished and very polished. Um, and my aim with this is to try and kind of demystify this process for you guys and help you understand that actually it's, it's quite simple when you break it down. Um, and it's really just a case of having somebody that can show you the techniques or having an environment where you can um, experiment and practice yourself. So that's all for my slides. We're going to get started now in Illustrator. Um, so take a moment to open that up if you haven't already. And the first thing that we obviously need to do is um, create a new canvas. So you might be able to see a create new button somewhere on the screen already. Uh, if not, you can always just go to file and then press new. So go ahead and create that new uh, canvas. And then over in the right hand side, um, you have the width and the height. We're going to just use a thousand by a thousand to be really simple. If you want to throughout this process, I'm going to be telling you exactly what color I'm using, exactly what, what size I'm using. So feel free to just copy what I'm doing if you want it to be exactly the same. But Having said that, feel free to you know change things as well. Like if you want to make a different color, go for it. Uh, have a play around. Um, likewise, you might want to follow me, and then at the end, afterwards, once you've kind of you know figured things out a little bit, you can always just go back and change things and and change the colors and push it even further. So make your canvas a thousand by a thousand. You shouldn't need to change anything else um, on this screen, um, but if you want to, just check that the color mode is RGB and the screen is 72. Um, but in, in Illustrator, that won't really matter. In Photoshop, that will become more important. So a thousand by a thousand, hit create. Now, once that's loaded, you should have a um, just an empty square canvas on your screen. Now, if you're not very familiar with Illustrator, you might want to look at my screen right now, and I'm just going to give you a really quick walkthrough on the common tools that we're going to use throughout this. Um, so the first one is on the toolbar on the left. So the toolbar is this palette of you know brushes and arrows and things like that. Uh, the first tool is the selection tool. So this is the little black arrow in the top left hand side. Um, a shortcut for using this tool is to press V on the keyboard as well. Um, so whenever I say select something, I mean use the selection tool. The second tool that we're going to use is the rectangle tool. Now this is actually part of the shape tool. So if you don't see the rectangle in the toolbar, um, it might be that you have the rounded rectangle tool, the ellipse tool, uh, or the polygon tool selected already, in which case you might see one of those. So if you need to find the rectangle tool, just right click and look for rectangle. Alternatively, you can just press M on your keyboard and that will give you a shortcut straight to the rectangle tool. Um, and the third thing I want to tell you is just the zoom tool. If at any point you want to get a bit closer to see what you're doing a little better, there's this little magnifying glass. So you can click and drag depending on your settings to zoom in and out. Um, you can obviously just click to zoom in. You can hold Alt or Option if you're on a Mac um, on your keyboard to zoom out. Um, and you can hold down the space bar to turn your cursor into a little hand and you can use that to click and drag around. I'm just going to zoom back out. Um, so that's it. That's pretty much the only tools we're going to use. So the first thing that we want to do is make our basic shape. So I'm going to click the rectangle tool. Um, and what you could do here is click and draw um, to make a rectangle um, and then change the size of it manually. Because we already know what size we want ours to be, because I'm going to um, tell you what size it's going to be. 
I'm actually going to show you a slightly different way of doing it. So if you click on the rectangle tool and then just click once in the canvas, you should get this little box that asks you exactly what size you want it to be. So this is just a little shortcut, really, if you already know how big you want it to be. And it is nice to pick, um, you know, good even sizes when you're working on things as well. It will make development easier uh, later on. So I'm going to use 540 pixels for the width and 160 pixels for the height. So just go ahead and put those in and press OK. And you should see a rectangle appear. Um, mine's gone a little bit off center, so I'm just going to grab the selection tool um, and just click and drag that into the middle. It doesn't really matter, um, just to be a little bit neater. So you should now have your rectangle. It should be 540 by 160 pixels. Um, and that's it, we have our shape now. The next thing that we're gonna do is give it those cut corners that you see on sci-fi buttons a lot. Um, and Illustrator has a really nice feature to do this. What you're gonna need to make sure is that you have the transform panel open. Um, so if you don't see the transform panel on your screen, mine's currently on the right-hand side, go up to window in the top, go all the way down to the bottom, and you should see transform. Make sure that that's ticked on. Um, once you've got that ticked on, this little transform panel should appear. I'm going to drag mine out and just put it near to my canvas so I can see it easier. Um, and that shouldn't really have anything in it just yet, but it will do in a second. So make sure you've got your um, transform panel open. So now what I'm going to do is go back to that selection tool, um, which is in the top left of your toolbar, and I'm going to select a rectangle. Now that I have that rectangle selected, um, I can change properties about it in the transform panel. So you should also see that the transform panel has now come to life with lots of numbers um, and you know, various properties that you can change. The properties that we're interested in are in the bottom half of this panel. And there's four kind of little um, corner type icons with numbers next to them. And then there's kind of like a link icon in the middle of them. We wanna make sure that that link icon is um, crossed off so like if you click it it should get a slash through it we want it to have a slash through it that means that we can change these corners independently without one corner affecting all of the others um, and what this does is basically sets the radius of each corner of the rectangle um, we're going to go ahead and use 40 pixels so i'm going to go in the top left one i'm going to write 40 and then i'm going to go in the bottom right one and I'm also going to do 40. The top right and the bottom left, I'm actually going to leave because I want this button to be kind of asymmetrical. Just the top left and the bottom right corners will have a radius of 40 pixels. Now, what this should have done is given you rounded corners on um, these opposing sides. Because this is a sci-fi game and I want it to have those cool angular corners, we're going to change the corner type. So that's what this little icon is. The icon's probably changed to a little rounded one now. If you click on that, you should have three options. Uh, rounded, which is what's selected, inverted round, and then the third one, which is chamfer. Uh, that's the one that we want. So if you click on chamfer on the top left corner, you should see it change. And then do the same thing on the bottom right. Click on that little rounded icon in the transform panel and click chamfer. And then that version changed too. Now, you should have a rectangle with two cut corners, one on the top left and one on the bottom right. Like I said, feel free to experiment with it. If you want to make all of them cut, go for it. If you want to do different ones, whatever, feel free to play around. Um, but this is what I've got now. So that um, is pretty much everything that we're going to do in Illustrator. Essentially, all I wanted to do here was just make this basic shape and copy that into Photoshop, and that's where we're going to actually bring it to life with colors and things. So all you need to do is take the selection tool, um, which is the arrow in the top left, click on your rectangle, and then press copy. So if you're on a Mac, that will be Command and C, and if you're on Windows, that will be Control and C, or whatever else you use to copy things. So I'm going to copy that now, and then open up Photoshop. Um, I'll give everybody a, a minute just to let Photoshop open if, if you don't already have it. Um, but once, once you have that copied onto your clipboard, open up Photoshop and we're going to do the same thing, just create a new canvas. We're going to make it the same size as before. So I'm going to do a thousand for the width, a thousand for the height. Um, now this is kind of what I was talking about before, about the resolution and the color mode being a little bit more important 
um, in Photoshop than in Illustrator. That's because in Photoshop, we're making the actual color assets that eventually would go into the game. Uh, normally what we do is we make these assets in Photoshop and then we hand them over to the programmers or the engineers, or in my case, sometimes it will just be to the client and they'll cut those assets up. Sometimes we'll cut them up for them into all the little slices that, that they need to put them into the, um, game engine basically and typically designing for a screen uh, we'll start with 72 pixels per inch as the resolution that's kind of the base size that we use for screen based design um, if you've ever been interested in print design before you might have used higher resolutions or if you're interested in photography you might use higher resolutions um, for screen uh, for game UI we typically just use 72 pixel per inch and then color mode in the same way, we want that to be set to RGB. That is quite important because um, if you had it set to CMYK, uh, CMYK, for example, which is what you use for printing, you might notice that your colors are a little bit dim or they feel a little bit desaturated. Um, and that's because screens use RGB or red, green, and blue, um, which is much brighter than what CMYK can produce, um, which you might recognize from a printer. If you've ever changed the ink in a printer, you might have noticed it was cyan, magenta, yellow, and black. Hi, Aidan. Sorry to interrupt. I was just wondering if, if for some of these functions, um, some students don't have the latest version of Photoshop, is there any mm -hmm. way of kind of getting around some of these things? Or what, what would you recommend from those things? Um, all of this stuff uh, in Photoshop should be available um, in terms of what I'm going through right now with the canvas. Um, is there anything specific that people uh, might be missing? Well, if, if um, there has been something that's come up, but if um, you could type in, anyone that's in the workshop, if you could type into the chat, if there's a certain function that you don't have, um, then we'll look to ask Aidan a little bit later on in the workshop. But once again, don't worry if you can't keep up right now, that's absolutely fine. We will be sending over this recording, okay? Mm -hmm. Okay, sure. Yeah, I'll try and keep that in mind. Um, obviously, there's a lot of versions out there and yeah, they are probably gonna hide things in uh, different places. Everything should be available, but yeah, it might be hiding off in a different panel somewhere. But yeah, I'll do my best. Um, so just let me know if there are any problems. Um, so anyway, we're back in Photoshop, a thousand by a thousand again for our canvas. Uh, and just hit create. So now you should have another blank white square. Um, if you'd copied your shape from Illustrator already, now you should be able to paste that in. But first of all, I'm just gonna do uh, one thing, which is I'm gonna set my default foreground color to black. Um, the default foreground color is what's in the bottom left um, of this toolbar on the left here. Right now, mine is set to kind of like a, an orange color. If you just press D on the keyboard, that should change it to the default, which is black and white. You can also press the little icon next to it, or you could click that swatch itself and pick black manually. Um, we wanna make sure that it's black for now, just cause it'll make sure that our shape is easy to spot when we paste it in. Now, before I go any further, I'm just gonna do the same thing as before and show you what tools we're gonna use um, in, in Photoshop. So once again, we have um, an arrow tool in the top of the toolbar. In Photoshop, this is actually the move tool. So it's slightly different to the select tool in Illustrator. And that's obviously for um, dragging a layer around the canvas. So you can click to move something around. The second tool that we're gonna use will be the type tool. Um, that's obviously just for creating a text box. So that works in the same way as if you create text in PowerPoint um, or something like that. Just click and drag to make a box and then type into it. The third thing that we're gonna use, um, we won't use this too much, but it's worth just mentioning. This is the direct selection tool. So this tool is specifically for clicking individual points on a shape. Um, we're gonna be making shapes uh, that are called vector artwork. And, and vector artwork is basically a series of points that join together to make a shape. The direct selection tool lets you click those individual points and, and makes uh, changes to them without changing the whole shape. So that's our toolbar on the left, and that's where we'll find those three tools. We're also gonna be interacting with the layer palette. Um, for me, that's on the right towards the bottom corner here, um, and that's all the layers on our canvas. Um, if you don't have the layer palette, go up to Window, um, and somewhere in the middle of the list, you should see Layers. Make sure that's ticked on. Make sure that it's Layers and not Layer Comps. Um, Layers is the one that we want. Um, if you want to make sure that your Photoshop looks a little bit more like mine, um, it might be worth just going up into Window 
um, going to workspace and choosing essentials default. And then just to be safe, press reset essentials as well. And this probably will still vary between versions. I'm on Photoshop 2020, um, but that should minimize differences between what you see on my screen and, and what you have. I'm using essentials default. Um, okay, so now we're finally ready to paste our shape. I've still got mine copied, so I'm just gonna go ahead and press Command and V. If you're on Windows, that will be Control and V. And you should get um, a dialog box pop up. If you don't, maybe just go back to Illustrator and copy your shape again, uh, just in case. Um, so after pressing Command or Control and V, you should get a little paste dialog box come up. Um, and that's asking you what you wanna paste it as. We wanna paste it as a shape layer which is the bottom option. This is quite important because it means that we're gonna um, paste that shape as a vector, which is what I mentioned just a minute ago, um, and not as pixels. And just to really simplify it, that basically means that we'll be able to easily edit and add styles later on. Um, so we're gonna choose shape layer and paste it. Now, having an editable shape is really important in um, game UI and, and in you know general UI as well, because it basically means that we can change things, we can increase their resolution, we can make them bigger um, as time goes on, and it's not locked into rasterized pixels, which if you've ever made a picture bigger and it's gone blurry, that's because it's um, a raster image and not a vector image. Obviously, with games, you know, next year when the PS5 or whatever comes out and it's, you know, 5K resolution or something, if you've made your game in like HD 1080p or in 4K resolution, your UI is going to go all fuzzy when you try and scale it up to 5K. So creating vector artwork is really important because it means that we can scale things up freely without losing quality. So, you know, when the next iPhone or whatever comes out and it's twice the size, we, can, we don't have to remake everything. So after pasting your shape and choosing shape layer, you should now see it um, as a black shape in the middle of the canvas. If it's not black, it's probably just because you didn't change your default foreground color and it's no big deal. Um, we're gonna change the color of it anyway. Um, and you should also see in your layer palette um, that shape one has appeared. It might be called something different in your Photoshop, but for me, it's called shape one. Um, so down here in the layer palette is where we're going to access everything to do with this shape and how we're going to add styles to it. First of all, though, we want to add a background color because right now it's sat on a white background, which doesn't really work very well for our sci-fi design. Sci-fi is often, you know, bright neon glowing colors, which work really well on a dark background. So what we're going to do is go over to that layer um, palette in the, in the bottom right. And then at the very bottom of that palette, there's a series of icons. There's seven icons. We want the fourth one along in my case, which is like a little circle with a line through it. So it's like a half white and a half black circle. Um, and if you click that, you should get a menu um, with solid color, gradient, pattern, etc., on it. What we're gonna do is click on solid color, which is gonna create a solid color layer. Um, it's called a color fill, and that should appear in your layer palette after you click it. And you should also get a dialog box um, where you can pick the color that you want that fill to be. Um, I'm gonna use like a really dark blue. Like I said, feel free to choose whatever you want, but if you wanna copy what I'm using, um, the color is 000, and you type that in this little box with the kind of hashtag symbol um, along the bottom of the, the window. The color I'm using is 000312. And that's basically a really dark blue. You can also pick a color manually by sliding in these um, like rainbow colored bars and such. Um, but yeah, that's my one zero 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 three one two, and then press OK. And as you might be able to tell, um, it's actually covered up the shape, which isn't what I want. That's just because in my layer palette, the color fill is on top of that shape. So all you need to do if that happens is pick that up, so click it and drag it, and just move it down underneath your shape layer and then let go. So you can just drag and drop those layers around. Um, and obviously whatever's at the top of the list is at the top of the canvas. Um, and it will cover up anything that's below it. 
So my layer palette is my shape on the top, my color fill in the middle, and then this default background layer um, at the bottom, which we don't need to worry about. So I now have a dark blue background and a black shape. Um, so the next thing that we want to do is actually change the color of the button shape because um, right now it's black. So this is when we'll use the direct selection tool. Um, so if you go into your toolbar on the left, towards the bottom of the list, there's a little um, cursor icon. It just looks like a mouse cursor. Um, you can also press A to go to this. Um, so have that selected. Then make sure you have your shape selected. So I'm going to click shape one in the um, layer palette. And then I'm just going to click and drag a box around that whole shape. And that will make sure that I select the entire thing and all of the points that make that shape. Now that I have that selected, I can change the fill color. Um, to do this, I'm going to go to the top um, in this, this options bar along the very top of the window. Um, and you should be able to see uh, fill, stroke, uh, maybe some numbers, width and height, etc. The one that we're obviously interested in is the fill because that's the actual fill color of this shape. Um, if you can't see this bar along the top, try going into window and then right at the bottom, there's application frame, options and tools. Um, it's options. So make sure that you have options ticked on and that should show you this bar. So once you have that and you found the little fill swatch, go ahead and click it. You should get something a little bit like a panel with some um, colored squares in it, which is the colors that have recently been used or default colors in Photoshop. And then in the top right of that panel, there's a little rainbow icon. And that's basically just the button to open up the color picker. Um, and this is how we're gonna pick what color that shape is gonna be. Now, I would recommend picking something that is lighter than your background color, but still quite dark. Um, I'm going to use 000D4D. And again, to put that color in, it's just in the bottom where the little hashtag icon is. So, and basically, this is um, a like hex code for the color. So all the, all the colors have a unique code that can be used to call upon them in various things, um, such as web design and in game engines as well. So yeah, I've picked 000 D4D, which is like a dark blue, press OK, and now my shape has changed color. If you struggled with that at all, or if the shape didn't change color, just make sure that you had the shape selected in the layer uh, panel first. Now, we've pretty much got all the basic stuff set up, and it's time to start adding some um, styles and effects. Um, to do this, we're going to use a palette called the Layer Style palette. This is probably like a bit of a Swiss army knife for me in my day-to-day -day life. It's where you add things like um, glows, patterns, gradients, borders, um, and all kinds of cool effects that we can build up bit by bit to create something that can look really realistic or just really stylized and cool. Uh, to open the layer um, style palette, it's from the layer panel in the in the right hand side and if you find your rectangle shape mine's called shape one you need to double click the empty space to the right hand side of that name so don't click the name itself don't click the icon click the empty space to the side of that layer name uh, and double click it and that should open up the layer style palette uh, if for some reason that doesn't work Along the bottom of the layer panel, there's a little FX icon. That's kind of like doing the same thing. Um, it's, you can use that as a shortcut to add what you want to add. We're going to add a stroke. So I'm just going to go off that, double click that again to open up the layer style. And what you should see is a list of options in the left-hand side. The first one is blending options. And then there might be something like bevel and emboss, stroke, inner shadow. Yours might be a little bit different to mine, but they should all be in there somewhere. The first one that we need is called stroke. Um, and if that sounds unfamiliar, it's actually the terminology we used for a border, basically, a, a, you know, like a line around a shape. So if you click stroke, and be sure to click the name stroke, not just the tick box, that should tick it and open the settings for that stroke. And that, this is basically where we specify um, all of the parameters that make that border, like how thick is it, how is it positioned, what's the opacity, what color is it, things like that. 
I'm just going to move this panel out of the way so I can actually see my shape while I edit it. Um, I'm going to press reset to default just to make sure that looks a little more similar to what you guys might have. Um, so now I'm just going to go through these parameters one by one. For size, I'm going to choose five pixels because I want it to be quite thick. Um, you might not be able to see anything yet. For, in my case, it's black, so it's not really showing up. But we're going to, we're going to change the color uh, anyway, so that doesn't matter. So I'm going to use five pixels for the uh, size. The position I'm going to leave as inside. Um, you could also have it outside or on the center, but generally we will want it to be inside um, because that will kind of preserve the nice silhouette of our shape and not start to affect it. So we're going to choose inside for the position. Blend mode can stay at normal. Um, and opacity, I'm going to move down. Um, and I'm just going to type 76, but you can also just move the little slider um, if you want to. Overprint, um, that shouldn't matter. You can have it ticked on or off. I don't think it will make a difference. I'm going to have it ticked off. And then fill type is set to color. And I'm going to click the little color box under that to choose what color I actually want it to be. And that will open up our color picker again. Um, actually, sorry. Forget that, I'm not gonna use a color. I'm gonna cancel that. I'm gonna use a gradient um, for the stroke. So where it says fill type, um, it might be set to color by default. If you click that little drop down, pick gradient, because um, we're gonna make something a bit cooler than just a flat color. So after changing that to gradient, you might have like a black to a white fade that's appeared and some more kind of complicated looking uh, properties. The first thing that we're gonna do um, is change the style. Right now it's linear. I'm gonna change that to reflected. For the angle, it's at 90, but I'm going to change that to zero, which basically puts the angle on this kind of like um, straight horizontal plane across the border. Um, and reflected is reflecting those colors either side of that. Um, and then scale, I'm going to leave at 100. I'm not going to change that. So now that we've got the kind of behavior of the gradient looking right, um, and a gradient, by the way, is just a fade from one color to another or multiple colors to another along a spectrum. I want to change the color of it. So I'm going to click the um, little black and white box um, next to the word gradient, which will open up the gradient editor. This can be a little bit confusing to learn at first. It might be a little bit weird if you've never used Photoshop before. Um, so you might want to look in the presets somewhere for just a basic black to white, just as a starting point. Um, and that should give you a one color that goes to one other color. And that's basically what we want. However, we don't want it to be black and white. We want it to be, um, like a light blue in the middle and a darker blue towards the outside. And to change the colors, you use these little, um, I think they're called color stops. Yeah, color stops, which is like a little box underneath the bar that's kind of pointing. Um, and we want the ones that are underneath, not the ones that are on top. So right now I can see I've got this little black one on the left hand side and I'm going to click on it. And then um, if you double click on it, it will give you a shortcut to the color picker. And then I'm going to change that color um, to a kind of like a medium royal blue color, which in my case is going to be 0050E3. And that's like this kind of like bright royal blue. So that's the color that I've got on the left hand side. Um, on the right hand side right now, it's white. So I'm going to go over to that color stop again. I'm going to double click on it. And I'm going to change this time to a light blue. Uh, in this case, that's going to be 279 CFF. And that's kind of like this bright cyan color. Um, now, if, if you followed along with what I've done, you might see that you've got um, a border around your shape that's light on the left-hand side and the right-hand side and dark in the middle. It might also be the other way around, uh, but don't worry about it. Um, but once you've picked your colors and you're happy with them, just press OK and you should be back to the layer style palette. Um, now, as I just mentioned, mine's light on the left and on the right and dark in the middle, but I actually wanna invert that. I want it to be light in the middle and dark on the edges. And to do that, I'm just gonna press this little reverse tick box next to the gradient color, and that just flips them around. Uh, so now it's light on the middle and dark on the left and the right. And that's the kind of effect that I want to create. I want to make it look like maybe there's some light shining along the button, or maybe that something from the middle of the button is emitting light outwards and kind of creating this highlight um, along the rim. 
now um once you're happy with that we're pretty much done with the stroke and we're just going to keep following this um process to add other effects such as a glow um, and a pattern and things like that so yeah so, sorry can we pause it there just for a moment just to let people kind of catch up yeah uh, sure in case there, there is a, anyone that just wants to kind of make sure that they're, they're doing things correctly also mm -hmm. can i just i'm going to interject just to ask you a, a, a question or two about yourself so mm -hmm. how did how did you get into the games industry to kick off with what was your journey like Okay, um, so yeah, basically I, I studied um, art and design all through school. So I did art at my GCSE level and then I went to college and again, I did kind of like a general art and design, I um, uh, can't remember what it was called back then, um, at college level. And then after that, I decided to go to university. I had a really strong interest in graphic design ever since I was quite young. So I started out by studying graphic design at university, but after a year I decided um, actually I wanted to move into games. And that was when I uh, switched and basically I went to NUA to study games art and design. Um, so that's what got me really learning about the games industry and how it works um, and really cemented my ideas on how I um, you know, what I wanted to do and what I wanted to build my career in. So I did my degree in games art and design. And when I got to my third year, and I was kind of nearing the end of my third year when everybody's trying to figure out what they're going to do and um, where they're going to go. Um, and I was approached actually by Sprung Studios through a connection uh, from the university, um, talking about the idea of doing an internship with them. Um, so I was like, yeah, that sounds amazing. Um, so I applied, I sent over like a portfolio and a CV and everything. And um, they liked my work. I had an interview. Um, I did what's called an art test, which is when they give you kind of like a, a brief to do and see how you answer like an artistic brief. So I did an art test for Sprung Studios. And again, they were happy with it. Um, so they took me on as an intern. Um, and my role as an intern was, you know, not too different from what it is now. I was like a junior UX and UI designer for Sprung Studios. Um, and I did that for maybe six months or so before I was offered a, a full-time role with Sprung. Um, and that's pretty much it from, from then till now. Uh, within about a year, I was promoted to um, an art director or a lead UX and UI designer role. Um, and that's what I've been doing for the past three or four years or so. Yeah, wow, wow. Hey, thank you for that. Um, and everybody that's in the session as well, if you do have any questions, obviously you're frantically kind of working on your buttons as well. But if you do have any questions, if you're just watching the video and you're planning on making your buttons a bit later, do please send us over any questions that you have for Aiden and we'll, we'll look to get those answered during and at the end of the session. But I'm gonna hand back to Aiden now to, to carry on. With the workshop. Thanks, mate. Awesome. Thanks, Tom. Um, yeah, okay. So I'm not sure how much time exactly we will have left, but I'll run through everything else and feel free to just stop me if um, if we do run out or if you want to go back into some more questions. But um, we'll see how much we can get through. So hopefully everybody's managed to get their gradient stroke um, added and they're happy with it. Now remain in the layer style panel. If you have lost that, don't forget, you just go into the layer panel in the bottom right double click that empty space next to the rectangle shape layer and you should find the layer style palette. Now the next thing that we want to add um, is an outer glow, which as you can imagine is a glow that surrounds the out outside of the shape layer. That's towards the bottom of the list for me. So find outer glow in this list on the left and click the name. That should tick it and it should also change these uh, settings that appear, um, which is basically how we change uh, all the parameters of that outer glow. I'm gonna just press reset to default just so it's the same as what you guys might have on your screen. Now, all the properties that I'm using for this, um, for the blend mode, um, it's currently set to screen but I'm going to change that to normal for now. For opacity, we want it to be quite faint, so I'm going to use 26%. Uh, noise, I'm just going to leave it zero. We don't want any noise. Um, and then the color, which you have like two options here, it's like a gradient color or a solid color. I'm going to click the left-hand one and just use a solid color. And then for the technique, which is in the section below that, I'm going to leave that as softer. For spread, I'm going to have that as 0% which is the default. And for size, I'm gonna make it way bigger because right now I can't really see it and I want it to be quite a big soft glow. 
So for size, I'm going to change that to 62 pixels. And now I can see there's quite a nice soft white glow. Um, I don't actually want it to be white though. So I'm going to go back to that little color swatch that we selected before, click into it, open up the color picker, and then I'm going to change that from white to 00. 53 CF. And again, that's like a bright blue color. So if you're using different colors, you might want to match that to whatever color you used for your border because we want those to feel sort of like the same element. I'm kind of imagining that that bright border around the edge is what's creating this glow. You know, maybe it's like a neon light that's, that's emitting um, a glow around it. So I'm, I'm happy with that color now. I'm going to press OK. And that's everything that we want to do with the outer glow. So feel free to just spend a couple more seconds tweaking those, you know, sliding those bars back and forth until you like the way that it looks. Um, the next thing that we're going to move on to is very similar, uh, but it's going to be an inner glow, which again, as you can imagine, is a glow that goes on the inside of a shape instead of the outside. So once you're happy with that, go stay in the layer style palette. We won't go out of this palette for quite a while. Um, look in that long list on the left hand side and look for inner glow. For me, that's kind of in between the two that we've done already. It's in the middle and click the name inner glow to add one of those to the shape and bring up the um, options to change it. If you click just the tick box, you might not get those options appear. So make sure you actually click on that name itself to, to bring those up. So the inner glow is going to use some similar kind of properties. It's going to be a nice soft glow and it's going to be like a bright blue. Um, I'm kind of imagining it as sort of the same as the outer glow. Like they're not necessarily two separate things. It's actually the light from that border that's emitting evenly around itself. So for blend mode, we're actually going to change it to overlay. So it'll probably be normal by default. I'm going to uh, open up the drop down menu and choose overlay. Overlay again is like a little bit of a, it's not a cheat, but it's something that I use a lot that just tends to make things look a little bit nicer because it blends your color with the layer below it. Um, so it's quite nice for getting all your colors to work in harmony. Right now it hasn't done very much because the color's just set to black but it will come into play later. So for the opacity, I'm going to put that all the way up to 100 because I want it to be quite bright. Noise again, I'm just going to leave that at zero. I, that's not something that I ever really use. Um, and then for the color, I'm just going to click into that little swatch and I'm going to use, in this case, a really bright electric blue. Um, so I'm going to use 00F6FF. And that's like a really, really light, uh, bright blue for me. However, because I set the blend mode to overlay, it's kind of softened it and blended it in with the colors below. So it doesn't actually look really jarring or anything. So I picked my color, uh, I've picked my blend mode, picked my opacity. Now it's time to just change the element section. So for the technique, I'm going to leave that on softer. Uh, for the source, I'm going to use edge. Um, if you try center, you might notice that the glow kind of inverses and the glow comes from the middle and goes outwards. That's a really useful technique to use sometimes as well. Uh, but in my case, I'm going to use edge. The choke, I'm going to leave at zero uh, percent. And then the size, again, I'm going to whack this up a little bit. I want that to be 65 because, uh, again, I want it to be a nice big soft glow. Um, it feels a little bit more subtle. Um, it's a bit more noticeable without being overpowering. Um, and yeah, I think it just creates a nice, nice effect on the button. So that's it with the inner glow. Um, as you can see, building up these styles is actually quite simple once you get the hang of um, all the options and such and you sort of figure out how to use them to make something look good. Um, so now we've got our stroke our inner glow and our outer glow all working together to build up the effects on our button. And we've done all of this with one layer in Photoshop, which is um, uh, really efficient, basically. So I'm happy with the inner glow. We're actually done in the layer style palette for now. We'll come back to it later. So I'm going to press OK and get rid of that um, and save everything that we've just done. The next thing that we want to do is make a pattern. Um, it's going to be a repeating pattern that goes over the whole of this button and it's called a scan line pattern, um, which comes from kind of like old, uh, TV monitors where you have like lines running down them. Um, and it's a, a pattern that's often used in sci-fi cause it gives things a bit of a technical look, it adds a little bit of texture to a shape or a UI element. Um, and to be honest, it just kind of looks cool, which is an okay reason to do something sometimes. So. 
we actually need to make a new document to make our pattern in. So if you go up to file and press new, it's going to be really tiny. So do eight pixels by eight pixels. The reason that it's so small is because we're going to repeat it as many times as needed to cover the whole shape. So pick eight pixels by eight pixels and then press create. And you will probably be faced by what looks like an empty screen, but is actually just a really zoomed out. Well, not zoomed out. It's just a really small canvas. Um, so obviously that's not going to be very easy to work in and we want to zoom in. So a shortcut to zoom in, if you're on windows is control zero. And if you're on Mac, that's command zero. And that basically is just a shortcut to fit your canvas to the screen. Um, so now for me, I've got a big white square, but it's actually just our really small canvas zoomed in. And what we're basically going to do is draw a black line from one corner to the other. Um, and we're going to use the pencil tool. So you probably won't see the pencil in the toolbar along the left. You'll probably see the brush tool, um, which is B as a shortcut. If you right click on that, if it is the brush tool and look for the pencil tool in the drop down menu, you should be able to click that and then you'll have the pencil tool activated. Now, you shouldn't need to change any settings of the pencil tool. By default, it should just be a one pixel by one pixel um, square. And you should see that like on your cursor now. Make sure your foreground color is still set to black. If not, just press D. And then we're going to start in the bottom left. You might want to look at my screen for this because it might not make sense out of context. We're basically just going to click a very bottom left to make a black square. And then to the top right of that, click again, and then click again, and just keep clicking to make one square right along the exact middle of the canvas until you have, <clears throat> excuse me, eight squares and a diagonal line from one corner to the other. Um, and that's gonna be our pattern. If this isn't a technique that you've used before, it might seem a little bit weird, but hopefully it will make sense soon. Um, so now that we've made that, we need to define it as a pattern, basically save it into Photoshop's library of patterns so we can call on it later and use it in that layer styles panel that we've been using up until now. So to define the pattern, go up to edit, Go to define pattern and you should get a little box asking you for the pattern name. I'll just give everybody a second to make sure that they've had time to draw it out. And then it's going to ask us for what we want to call it. Um, <clears throat> excuse me. Ultimately, it doesn't really matter, but it's always nice to give things a good name. So I'm going to call it scan lines. If I had to hand something over to one of my colleagues or uh, to a client, they'd really appreciate things being named. Uh, properly, which goes for your layers as well. One of the worst things as a designer is being given a file full of layers that are not named properly and nothing makes sense and you can't find anything. So I always like to make sure I'm, you know, been organized as I work through things. So I'm going to call it scan lines. I'm going to press OK. If you missed that, that was edit and then define pattern. So now I've done that, we're done with this. We're going to go back to our original um, Photoshop file, which has our button in it, and we're going to basically add that as an overlay that covers this whole uh, layer. So we need to bring the layer style palette up again. So if you find your layers panel in the right hand side, once again, just double click that empty space uh, next to the name and you should get the layer style palette. Along the left hand side, um, probably just above outer glow, you should see pattern overlay. Um, click on that. If um, at any point you can't find the specific thing I'm talking about. If you look at the little FX button in the bottom left and click that, you might be able to add things that have been deleted from this menu. Um, I already have it, so I don't need to do that. I can see pattern overlay, so I'm just going to click pattern overlay. Uh, by default, that's added a dotted pattern to mine. Um, that will be completely different on your Photoshop, I imagine, depending on what patterns it has installed by default. Uh, but that doesn't matter because we're going to change it anyway. So once you have that pattern overlay added um, and you'll have these settings showing up to the right hand side of that, we'll just work through these like we did before. Blend mode again, I'm going to change that and get our good friend overlay um, back. That's going to actually have a really nice effect on this once we add the pattern in. Um, so I'm going to choose uh, overlay for the blend mode. I'm going to set the opacity to 10 because I want it to be quite a subtle pattern. Actually, 
I might bump that up to 15 just so we'll be able to see it a little bit better. Um, so I'm going to set 15 for the opacity and then you'll have this like big swatch of which pattern is going to be used. If you click on that, you should get this drop down with like, it might have different categories of patterns. It might just have a list of existing patterns. Um, but either way, you're going to want to scroll all the way to the bottom, which will have the pattern that you just made called scan lines or whatever else you decided to call it. So I'm going to click on that. And now it's added the uh, scan lines pattern to my shape. Aiden, um, if I could just yes. for a moment. Obviously, we've um, just hit three o'clock. We're mm -hmm. going to be running over a bit longer. Um, if you can't make it, then please do pick up the recording. But other than that, I'm going to hand back over to Aiden, who's going to lead us through to the end of the workshop. Okay, nice. I'll keep going then in that case. Um, <clears throat> okay, so I've added the pattern swatch. Um, I've picked my scanline one that I created. Um, it doesn't look like anything is showing up, which um, seems a little bit weird, but it's just because the scale is set to 50%. So the pattern is there, it's just really small and I can't see it. So I'm gonna change the scale um, to 200%. So it's gonna be twice as big as the pattern that we actually made. Um, actually, that looks a little bit too big. Let's try 100. Uh, yeah, 100 looks better. It's still a bit faint, so I'm gonna go back to the opacity and I'm gonna try actually bumping that up to maybe 25. You might not be, if you're looking at my screen, you might not be able to see this very well because of the quality, but um, it's there and it's subtle and that's okay because we don't want it, you know, again, we don't want it to be too overpowering. We wanna make sure that the player can actually read the text that's gonna be on top of it. Um, so I'm gonna change the opacity uh, to 25% and that should be it, we should be done. Um, with the pan there. So once you're, once you're all done with that, once again, we're done with the layer style palette now. So just press OK to make sure that you save those changes that you've made. Um, and the next thing we want to do is actually add the text to the button. Um, this is obviously the text that tells the player what the button is going to do. Um, in this case, I'm going to call it an upgrade button, but you can call it whatever you want. Um, you know, whatever you imagine your button will be used for. You know, sometimes it might be like um, confirm or OK or delete or equip, uh, depending on, um, you know, what the player is doing in the game. So we're going to go to the text tool for this, obviously, which is in the left hand uh, toolbar. Uh, for me, it's towards the bottom. Your toolbar might look slightly different depending on the settings that you have. Uh, we're going to click the text tool. And then this is quite important. We're going to click and drag, but not on your shape. We want to make sure that we click and drag in a space somewhere away from the shape. The reason for that is if you click on the shape itself, Photoshop might try and be smart and turn the shape into a text box, which is not what we want to do. So click and drag to make your text box somewhere above your shape. Um, make it relatively big just to make sure you have enough room. And then in my case, it's filled it with some placeholder dummy text that we don't want. So I'm going to press delete. And then I'm just going to type in upgrade. Uh, you can't really see it right now because it's made it black. So if you just highlight that text, look towards the um, top window and you should see a little uh, like black uh, swatch or a different color swatch if it's not black. Um, and you can click that to change the color. I'm just going to make it white just so I can see it. If you can't see that along the top, try looking for the properties panel. If you don't have the properties panel, uh, go to window, make sure properties is ticked on. Um, and then in my case, that's along the right hand side. You can also change the text color uh, from there. Just make sure that you have your text um, selected in the layer palette or highlighted in the text box itself. So once you've typed your text and you've picked the color, you might also want to change the size and obviously the actual font that you've used. Um, by default, mine happens to be the right one because it was the last thing that I did. Um, and it's a font that I have included in um, the worksheet folder. I'm not sure if you have access to that yet, um, but you can pick any font you want. For now, if you need to just pick something that's um, already installed on your system, later on you can install other fonts um, from places like Google Fonts or Font Squirrel, which are some safe places to get free fonts. Um, and just pick one that you want. The one I'm using is called Furor, and it's kind of like a bit of a cliche looking sci-fi font, but I like it for what I'm doing right now. Um, so that's called Furor. And for the size, I've got 61 point. Depending on the font you're using, you might want to change that. Um, for me, it's kind of like the right size to just about fit with the size of the button. 
So um, the only other thing to do while we're in here is make sure that that text is aligned to the center. So you should see some little alignment controls probably in the bar along the top. Um, like what you would see in Word or something, you know, just to choose that the text is aligned into the center because we want to make sure that it's in the middle of the button. So once that's all looking good, um, click off onto the uh, move tool in the toolbar along the top left. And that's just going to deselect that text box because we've finished editing the text inside it. Now we want to click and drag to move that text into the middle of our button. Now, something to be aware of is the move tool has this function called auto select um, along that top bar. If you have that ticked, it will click and drag whatever is underneath your cursor, regardless of what layer you have selected in the layer panel. If you have that unticked, it will click and drag whatever you have selected in the layer panel. So if you wanna be safe, untick it, and then in the layer panel, click on your text layer, which it probably says upgrade as the name or whatever you've called it. Uh, make sure you have that selected. And then using the move tool, you should be able to click and drag and move your text around wherever you want to put it. I'm just going to roughly put that into the middle of the button. Um, Photoshop has been quite helpful and shown some like pink guidelines to help me center it all up. Don't worry if, if, if you, you know, if you don't get that, just do it by eye for now. Um, and I'm just going to do a little trick um, that I do when I'm making buttons, which is, so we need to open up the text box again. To do that, double click the T icon in the layer panel. And that should select your, select your text automatically. And it will bring up the bounding box around the text, which is like the dashed lines that show Photoshop what space the text should be clipped within. Um, and I'm gonna grab this handle on the bottom, which is the little square along the border, um, the bottom one in the middle, and I'm gonna drag that up just because it's way too tall. I don't need the box to be that tall. So just to like neaten things up, I'm just gonna shorten that a little bit. But then the important thing is these handles on the left and the right. Um, again, you'll probably be familiar, even if you've never used Photoshop before, with using this kind of control when you're making presentations in PowerPoint and things like that. So I'm going to grab the um, little uh, square handle on the middle in the left, and I'm going to drag it until it perfectly matches the left edge of my button. And then I'm going to grab the one on the right, and I'm going to do the same thing. I'm going to drag it until it matches the right edge of my button. And basically all that's done is made the text box exactly the same width as my button, and because the text is center aligned, it means that the text is perfectly in the center. So that's just something that um, I like to do to make sure things look neat and tidy. Even if I change what text is in the box, it's going to you know, always make sure it's in the right place. So once you have your text looking good and in the middle, if you want to, we can start adding some styles to the text as well. Um, we're going to break out the layer, the layer style panel again, but this time we're going to do it on the text layer rather than the shape layer. So double click the empty space next to upgrade. Um, so, you know, remember we're doing this on the text layer in the layer panel now, not the shape layer. So double click that. You should bring up the layer style palette this time for the, for the text. Um, we're going to add in um, a gradient overlay. Um, so in the left hand side, find gradient overlay, click on that. Um, I'm going to reset to default. Choose for the blend mode, going to go for normal. Um, for opacity, we're going to go for 100%. And then the next thing we'll do is actually change the gradient itself. So click the little like drop down box of the gradient. Um, just like what we did before with the border, you'll have these little text stoppers, uh, color stoppers rather. I'm going to double click the first one and I'm going to change it to um, a really bright electric blue again. If you want to pick colors from your existing button, if you hover over your canvas, you should get like a little eyedropper, like a little color picker icon, and you can just pick and choose existing colors from your button. So that's always an easy way of making sure that your color palette is nice and coherent and you're not mixing too many crazy colors in there because we want to make sure that, you know, the theme matches and feels like it's all part of one family. So I'm going to pick a really light blue. I'm um, going to make it quite faint. So I've gone for 50 ECFF. I'm going to press OK. And then for the second color on the gradient, I just want it to be white. Um, actually, let's not make it perfectly white. I'm going to double click that. 
I'm gonna pick the light blue again. I'm gonna just make it like a really, really, really light blue. Um, in my case, that's E6, F, E, F, F. So my gradient now goes from like a bright electric blue to a really, really, really pale blue. And I'm gonna press okay. And now I've got this nice like faded color effect on the text. Um, for this style, I've got it set to linear. For the angle, I've got it set to 90. And basically that just means that the gradient is traveling in a linear fashion. So it's just a straight line and it's at a 90 degree angle, which is just um, straight up vertically, basically. Um, you can obviously play around with these too if you wanna make it like a diagonal or if you wanna use the reflected layer style again. Um, <clears throat> go for it, but I'm gonna use lin uh, linear and 90 degree. So that's it for the gradient overlay on the text. One more thing we're gonna to add to the text is an outer glow. So find outer glow in the left hand list, uh, click on that. Um, it might already have like a nice blue glow set to it from when we were adding outer glows before. Um, so I'm gonna leave a lot of this roughly the same. I'm just gonna change the opacity to 40. Uh, and I'm gonna change the color from this darker blue to again, I'm gonna use a bit of a lighter blue. Um, I'm just gonna color pick from uh, the text I made before. Oh, that didn't work, it just picked white. Um, so I'm just gonna go for a light blue in the color picker. So in my case, I'm using 00F CFF. And that is the color of my outer glow. Um, everything else, I think I'll just reduce the size slightly. So the technique I'm gonna leave softer. Uh, the spread, I'm going to leave zero, and the size, I'm just going to reduce that down to about 30. Now, I'm looking at that and feeling like it might look a little bit too bright, so I'm going to go back up and change the opacity down to 30. Um, so, you know, when you're doing this kind of thing, I find that I'm hopping back and forth, turning things on and off, comparing how it looks, maybe making something a little bigger, a little smaller until I'm happy with it. And that's the really great thing about adding styles in this way rather than like painting them by hand, for example. Everything is so editable. Um, it's really easy to go back and change things or even like make a duplicate of this and then just change a few colors to make a you know, a different second button that's like red or something like you might have seen in my example at the beginning. So there's the outer glow, um, everything on the text I'm happy with now. Um, so I'm just gonna go ahead and press okay. Now, what we have now is pretty much um, the finished button. There's a few extra details that you can add if you want to. Um, I'll probably just go through those relatively quickly. So feel free to follow along if you want, um, or just, um, you know, call it finish now and watch me from now on to just learn a few extra things. Essentially what I'm gonna do is add a couple of little dot shapes around the edge. Um, and I might also add some arrows in the background in the middle. Um, so to do this, I'm gonna use the rectangle tool, um, which is found in the toolbar on the left. When I'm making shapes, I always make sure that this drop down in the top is set to shape. Um, if you have an older version of Photoshop, you might not see that. Um, but if not, don't worry about it. If you can though, set it to shape because that will mean that we're making vector shapes. Again, like I explained in the beginning, that's quite important. Um, for the fill, I'm gonna choose like a um, bright color and I'm gonna zoom in a little bit using the magnifying glass so I can see what I'm doing. <clears throat> and then I'm just gonna start drawing rectangles. So I'm just gonna click and drag. What I'm doing right now is holding shift to make sure it stays perfectly as a square. Uh, in some versions of Photoshop, that might be the other way around. So you have to not hold shift to make it perfectly a square. But if I let go, I can draw like any kind of rectangle or, or whatever shape. But if I hold down shift, it's gonna keep those um, proportions constrained neatly. So I'm gonna draw a square in the bottom left. I'm gonna use the move tool to just nudge that using the arrow key so it's perfectly in the corner. And then I'm gonna, while I'm still in the move tool, I'm gonna hold down the alt key or the option key. And that's basically the little duplicate shortcut. And if I'm using the move tool and holding alt, I can click and drag on that shape to duplicate it. So now I've got two and I'm just gonna move it into the top right corner. Now I've got these two little like sci-fi looking dots. Um, I'm gonna go back to the rectangle. I'm gonna draw some little lines along the top here maybe another just tiny square along the top. 
And then I'm going to do kind of like this similar sort of thing in the bottom right as well and just keep drawing a few little dots until I feel like it looks sufficiently high tech and sci-fi. Um, now what I'm going to do just again, you know, using these little sort of cheats to make stuff look cool, I'm going to select all those layers in the uh, layer panel and then I'm going to change the blend mode from normal. So that's this little drop down that's kind of like towards the top of the layer panel. I'm gonna change the blend mode from normal to overlay. Um, you might also be able to see on my screen, if I hover over these, I can kind of see like a preview of what it will look like. Some versions of Photoshop don't have that, um, but some of the newer ones do, and it's quite handy to just browse through these until you find something that looks cool. So I'm gonna choose overlay, um, and that's kind of made them like kind of cool and transparent and, and blend in with the background. Um, and yeah, I'm happy with those. So I'm gonna go back and zoom out. And just one extra bonus thing that I'll really quickly show you is how I added those arrows. Um, if I just bring this up again. So these arrows um, in the background of the shape, I'll just really quickly show you. I don't expect you to necessarily follow along to this part, um, but it might be interesting for those of you that are curious. So I'm gonna add a rectangle. I'm gonna hit Command T to go into free transform mode. I'm gonna hover over the corner to rotate it to make a diamond. And I'm gonna hit enter to save that. And then I'm gonna move it into the middle. I'm gonna select it. I'm gonna choose the fill. Uh, I'm gonna have no fill. I'm going to add a gradient overlay in the layer styles panel. I'm going to make that a zero opacity fill. Um, and I'm going to keep that light blue as one end. I'm going to hit reverse so that comes from the other way and press OK. And then this is just a little trick. If I use the move tool, then open the gradient overlay, the move tool is still active and I can move that gradient using the move tool, um, which I was really really impressed with when one of my colleagues uh, showed me that at Sprung. Um, so I'm gonna move that into where I want it to be, uh, a little bit higher maybe, so it's like kind of fading off into nothing along the bottom. And I'm gonna hit okay. Um, now obviously this like uh, triangle shape is bleeding out of the edge of the button, I don't want that. So I'm gonna select my button, use the direct selection tool. I'm gonna draw a shape around it to select all of those points that make that tool. I'm gonna press copy go back to my arrow shape that I made or my diamond shape that I made, and then I'm gonna paste those shapes onto it. Um, and it didn't work. So I'm gonna try that again. I just select those and then paste those on. No, okay, I'll do this a different way. I'm gonna select that like that, and then I'm gonna create a layer mask like that. So that's basically masked that diamond shape into the button, uh, so it doesn't bleed off from the edges. And then I can also unlink that click my shape and move it around freely within those bounds. <clears throat> and it's kind of like acting as a um, stencil basically. Um, like, you know, if you were doing traditional artwork with spray paint, you make a stencil to make sure that your uh, paint stays within certain bounds. So I can move that around. I'm also gonna duplicate it and make another one, duplicate it and make another one. I'm holding Alt to duplicate it. And then I'm gonna go down the list and change the opacity of each one because right now they're obviously really bright, I can't actually read the text properly. So I'm gonna put that down to, let's say 20, and then the second one, I'm gonna try 30, and then the third one, I'm gonna do maybe uh, 50 is too much, let's try 35. And then I've kind of created this like increasing intensity of each one. Um, I still think they're a little bit bright, but that's because they're on top of the um, letters right now. So I'm gonna grab them and move them below the uh, text layer in the layer palette to make sure they're underneath. Um, and now I've kind of just created an extra effect. And you know, if I was making this as like a real button, um, for, a, for a video game, I'd probably be thinking like, how can I make it really obvious to the player uh, what this button does? Um, how can I communicate the idea of upgrading something without them actually even having to read the word upgrade? So there's a lot of subtle cues that you can use, um, like adding these upward moving arrows into the background, you know, that 
that makes you think of upgrading or improving something. Um, you could also even animate them, have them like moving slightly um, to draw the player's attention to them. Something that I'll be thinking about a lot is what's the most important thing on a screen when I'm designing it? What do we want the player to do? What is the player most likely to want to do themselves? And how can we kind of, um, you know, use psychology combined with art to direct them along that path that we want them to follow? Um, and obviously our, our motives there are to make sure that they can find the things that they want to find really easily um, and not get frustrated along the way. And there's a lot of things you can do uh, to create that. You can use shape like I've just done with the arrows. You can use color and value. Uh, people's eyes will probably be mostly drawn to the brightest values on a screen. So that would be like the lightest colors. Um, and obviously animation. If you see something animated, your eye is probably going to be drawn to it as well. Um, you'll probably notice that with advertising on a web page, they're always going to make the banners like moving and animated because they want your eye to be drawn to them. Um, and all, all these kind of things, the sort of tools that we have to solve the uh, UX problems that come our way as UX designers or UI artists. Um, so that's it. I'm going to leave the button there. I'm, I'm quite happy with that. You know, maybe if I was making this for real, I'd stay and tweak a few bits. I'd step back. I'd look at it. I'd ask for somebody's opinion. Um, something that I also do is just stand back and squint at it and like see what stands out to me the most. Um, or maybe I'd duplicate it and make another one like I did um, with this example here, I just duplicated it, went back, changed all those blue colors to red, and then I kind of added some more like uh, motion blur effects and things to, to change it up a little bit. When I was making this one, I was imagining that it would be um, like a destructive button, what we call a destructive action, which is when the player is doing something that um, is, well, destructive, like maybe they're uh, deleting something, maybe they're throwing something on the ground um, or otherwise doing something that we might want to warn them about. So um, again, I was using shape to try and convey that. I added like a diagonal line to the background that sort of hints at that purpose um, without being having to be really explicit about it. Um, and I also added a few little motion blur effects to further draw attention to that. Um, around the edges. But um, yeah, that's pretty much it. If anybody has any questions for me or wants me to go back over anything or has any more questions about my career, um, if we have time, I'd be more than happy to answer them. Um, I hope that you all enjoyed and hopefully you managed to follow along. Uh, if you didn't, don't worry about it. There is a worksheet, as Tom has mentioned, and the video is going to be recorded as well. But um, yeah, I really hope this has been helpful for some of you guys. Aidan, that was awesome. Thank you so much. This is amazing. It looks so professional, so slick. <laughs> what, what a great workshop. So, um, hey, initially, uh, I'm just going to kind of round things up and then we're going to just answer a few questions. We've got a few questions that have come in over the chat. So thank you guys for, for putting those in. Um, but before we kind of bring things to a close, I just want to thank everyone for taking part. And once again, I'd like to apologize for the session moving back today. Um, I just want to also remind you about a variety of other sessions that we've got going on as part of our summer school workshop series. One, workshops that are related to this one include uh, ones like album cover design, as well as working with Blender on designing characters, so 3D digital modeling. But there's a, a variety of other workshops that you might be interested in also, things that aren't like this, things like textile uh, kind of dyeing processes and, and other areas that are involved with fashion and acting. So please get involved with a variety of other workshops. Um, also, if you would like to receive your certificate, we'd like you to attend six workshops out of the 12 that we've got in the series and to submit work to us from three of those. And as a result of that, we'll send you out a certificate. Now, the certificate is really useful um, if you're looking to develop a UCAS application, you're applying to universities and you're wanting to show that you're going over and above um, what's kind of expected of you, then it's a great way of kind of complementing your portfolio. Now, other than that, yes, if you do want to submit your work as, a, as part of that, please send it over to us at student.recruitment at nua.ac.uk. You can also um, send your work over to us um, on our hashtag, that's uh, NUA, uh, at NUA Outreach. If you want to uh, showcase your work um, to us over Instagram, we'd love to, to see your work that way. And also, um, Gavin's going to be putting into the chat um, where you can access the, um, the, the other workshops. Obviously, you've been to it before, but we're just going to put the link 
in the chat. And also, um, if Gavin, you could also put in the at NUA outreach um, for the, the Instagram and the student.recruitment at nua.ac.uk for students to submit their work. That would be fantastic. Um, other than that, please do fill out the evaluation form we're going to be sending over. Um, if you're able to do that and submit it, um, that gives you a chance to win a Chili's bottle as well. I think they're really cool. They're a sweet little kind of yellow item and a lot of people at our university really want them, but there's not that many out there. So um, please do send those over and you'd be in with a chance of winning that Chili's bottle. Um, and other than that, I, once again, thank you, Aidan. Um, this recording will be available after the session within one or two days and we'll also be developing a, a workshop um, spreadsheet as a dimension to help you with step by step at each process or each step of the way within this process to make the button but right let's go over to the questions now before we finally wrap things up uh, thank you for um, popping those into the chat Gavin and um, so um, oh this is um, you might be able to answer this one, Aidan. If you can't, then, then myself or Gavin is able to answer it. So what's the difference between game design and games art? Okay, uh, so the course that I did at Newer that you guys might have heard of is game art and design, which does a bit of both. Uh, but typically game design would be um, actually designing what the mechanics of the game are and how they work and then game art would be how things in the game look so what style the environment is or what style the characters are brilliant thank you very much mate um at NUA we have two courses we've got games development which looks more at the mechanics and the programming of the game and we've got games art and design which Aiden took part in, part in which is orientated more towards the front end, the visuals, the artwork, um, and a bit of, of the game playability as well. Um, so, um, can you tell us a challenge you faced in your course um, becoming a UX or a UI designer? Mm -hmm. Okay, so I think probably the main one, so the first one would be deciding that that's what I actually want to do. That took me, you know, a little while on the course before I figured it out. Once I decided that, I think the main challenge is really just like learning how you do all of this um, because it's a very specific discipline um, and there isn't a lot of resources out there that will tell you how to do it, which there are with things like um, graphic design and 3D modeling and stuff. UX UI design is so niche even more so when you become UX and UI design for games, because UX and UI design is normally for like um, web and mobile apps and stuff. So that was the challenge, learning how to actually do it. And the way that I did that was partly combining the skills I'd already learned from graphic design and general art. A lot of those theories do apply. And then the second was by watching what other people do and learning from them in my internship at Sprunk Studios. Um, and again, and just like becoming more familiar with the tools themselves and then kind of just you know figuring out okay if I want to make a button look like this using my existing knowledge of Photoshop how would I go about it um, and yeah kind of putting it all together so I think that was probably the biggest challenge for me. And we've got this really lovely question which is your which is what's your favorite part of a project? favorite part of a project so my projects normally go from getting a brief from the client about what the game is um making a big flow of everything so like a flow diagram of like the player goes from here to here and here and here then we make what's called wireframes which is where we lay out what the screens look like in black and white um so we're focused purely on function and not art at that stage once we're happy with that, we go to making um, what's called concepting. So that's a little bit similar to concept art in game design, if you're familiar with that. It's where we're just bashing out loads of like art concepts of like, it could look like this, it could look like this. Um, and then once everyone's agreed on that and we've picked our style, like it's gonna be this clean fantasy style, for example, then we just make all of the screens based on the wireframes from that. Out of all that, I'd say my favorite is probably that concept art stage because everything is so free. Um, it's very collaborative, it's very brainstormy, it's just all about ideas. There's like not really many rules to follow um, because it's not the finished piece yet, you're just experimenting. So I really like that phase. I also really like the UX phase though, which is all about problem solving um, 
and like figuring out how to make things work best. Um, so yeah, that would probably be my favorite part. Mm. Thanks, mate. So um, my next question is, how long does a project usually take? Okay, so this is probably going to vary a lot. And in what I do, it might be a little bit different because we're kind of contracted by the client for a set amount of time. Um, a game itself could take 10 years to make. It could, you know, could take five years. Sometimes it might even take less, like two years. My engagement with a game varies from a few months to possibly up to maybe two or three years. Um, I think my longest running project is around two or three years now. The shortest, if we were gonna go really short, was probably like four weeks or something. So I think the answer to that is it varies, but probably at least six months. Okay, excellent. <laughs> Um, so, hey, there's um, just a question that's come in that's more administration orientated for us. Um, so it's, uh, do we submit the work after every workshop or do we collate everything and submit it at the end of the summer school period? Um, you can do either. Um, from my perspective, it's slightly easier if you submit it all together, um, but you can do whatever works best for you. Um, okay, so... Um, yes, you can save your work as a JPEG or PDF. That's absolutely fine. Um, I'm just looking for a few more questions for Aidan. There's a, a few technical questions that have come in. Um, I don't know whether it, it's it's worth if because of the amount of time we, 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 we've run on a bit. Um, so sorry about that. Um, for the technical questions, if you'd like to email us at student.recruitment at nua.ac.uk and we'll answer those kind of on a one-to-one -one basis. Um, so if anything comes up, then, then we can help you that way ra rather than answering them in this context. Um, okay, so here's one for you, Aidan. Um, so how are your user experience or user interface skills kept uh, upgraded by yourself? How do you keep it fresh? Okay, that's a cool question. That's a good question. Um, and I think that, I, well, like with all disciplines, um, not just art, it's just practice. Um, it's what I do every single day for eight hours a day every week. So inevitably, I'm going to get better. Um, but the way that I really effectively get better from that is by evaluating what I'm doing. Um, every time we work on a project, or we do a sprint of work, as we call it, which is like a short chunk of work as part of a project, we have a reflective phase at the end of it where we think about what we could have done better. Um, and that's something that I do on a micro and a macro scale. So every piece of work I do, I'm reflecting on how I could improve it. Um, and then I apply that next time. Time. In terms of technical proficiency, I guess it gets better just by fumbling around in the software until I figure it out, asking people that know how to use it, watching YouTube videos um, and things like that. So yeah, practice, I think. Brilliant, brilliant. Thank you very much. Okay, well, it looks like that is all I can see for questions. I apologize if I've overlooked any of your questions that you've sent. Um, thank you so much uh, to everybody for taking part. Thanks again, Aidan. There's so much love for you on the chat, so, so that's great. Um, guys, once again, please do have a look at the recordings. Please have a look at some of the other workshops and see what you might want to get involved with. Maybe try something that you've never heard of before as well, just to, to see where your creativity lies. Um, other than that, thank you very, very much. And we'll have this recording ready for you shortly. Thank you. And we'll catch you again soon. Awesome. Thanks a lot, everybody. It was a lot of fun. Bye. Cool. Catch you later.